Director of the Europe Direct Information Centre at Blanchestown Library, part of the Fingal Network of Libraries. Welcome to the third in our series of interviews on the European Green Deal. In today's interview, I'll be speaking to Dr Sinead McCarthy. Dr McCarthy is a researcher with Chagas. She graduated with a PhD in 2003 from UCC in the area of public health nutrition. She also holds a Master's in Food Science and Nutrition and a Bachelor's of Science in Physiology. Both were awarded by UCC. Sinead commenced her working career with UCC in 1996 in the area of Human Nutritional Physiology. In 1997, she joined Trinity College, where for nearly 10 years, she managed many of the national food consumption surveys. In 2007, Sinead joined Chagas at the Ashtown Food Research Centre, where she is responsible for leading Chagas's consumer behaviour research programme in relation to food and health. Her research projects include consumer food and health behaviour and food sustainability. Sinead is a member of the Food Safety Authority and is the Vice Chair of the European Sensory Science Society. In this interview, I speak to Dr McCarthy about the farm to fork strategy part of the European Green Deal. So Dr McCarthy, thank you very much for uh, joining me this morning for this talk. Thanks Barry, I'm delighted to have been invited to have a chat with you today and discuss this very important topic. And of course, you're going to be speaking about the farm to fork strategy part of the um, European Green Deal. I know your work keeps you probably closer to the fork end of things than the farm end. But even so, could you tell us um, basically what is the farm to fork strategy? OK, so as, as, as you've mentioned already, it's a part of, of the Green Deal with the aim of the Green Deal making the European economy um, more sustainable in a just and inclusive way. Um, and it's our future roadmap, if you like, for our food system. And specifically within the farm to fork strategy, what they want is that our food system becomes more healthy, but also becomes more sustainable. So that as we produce our food, it's being produced in a more sustainable way that will have a lower climatic impact mm -hmm. and therefore making the healthy and sustainable choice the easy choice for consumers. Mm. So, so for a long time we've spoken about having a healthy diet and now you're saying is we, we need to move towards a diet that's not only healthy but sustainable also. So I, I'll move on from that. Um, the Vice President of the European Council, Franz Timmermans, he spoke of the importance of restoring the balance between human activity and nature. So what does this mean specifically for the agricultural sector? So, like all other sectors, um, every activity that we engage in has its carbon footprint and associated sustainability measures. So there's nowhere in our lives from food production and farming um, to our daily activities that don't have an impact. And we can improve these impacts and improve our um, food system by implementing more sustainable practices at farm level, at production level and at consumption level as well. And could you tell us about a little bit some of the practices that might be changing? Um, so for example, we can look at more efficient ways of producing our food and um, more efficient ways of our using our land resources. What mm -hmm. are the, the, the best ways to use the land resource? When is it optimal time to put cattle out to graze? And when should we fertilize or not? So making sure and, and, and efficient use of fertilizers as well. So it's making sure that all of the resources that we use in producing our food, whether it's at the farm or in our kitchen, that we use them in as efficient a way as possible and adopt the most sustainable approach as possible. Thanks for that. And, and um, one of our interviews will actually be with Aoife Sheridan from Fingal County Council. And, and I know she's going to speak quite a lot about uh, agriculture in relation to Fingal, uh, which is more the market garden vegetable uh, type of agriculture. So it's interesting that you, you, you've mentioned that. Um, so I'm going to move now away from the kind of farm end of things towards the, the fork part of the strategy, I suppose. Well, the thing that will affect probably most of the people watching these videos. Um, you sent me an, an excellent article that you wrote about our dietary habits in Ireland. And it contains some very interesting statistics um, 
regarding how healthy and sustainable our diets are right now. And could you tell us a little bit about this? I think you mentioned there were three different groups that were identified. Yeah, that's right, Barry. So we looked at the National Adult um, Nutrition Survey. And this was a survey that took place nearly 10 years ago now. Um, and it surveyed a thousand Irish adults from all over Ireland and looked at all of the foods they consumed over a four day period. So normally um, in the area of, of nutrition, we look at all of these foods in terms of how healthy our diet is. Are we meeting fat recommendations? Are mm-hmm. we meeting various vit- vitamin and mineral recommendations? And that's how we traditionally analyze these kind of data. But I took it one step further and actually converted the foods that we eat using conversion factors into a carbon footprint associated with every food that we consumed over the four, four days. And after that, then I was interested to see what kind of patterns of consumption do we see and what are the foods contributing most to these patterns Mm -hmm. and and so on. And took the first analysis of of the National Irish Diet in terms of its carbon footprint. And the results we got were very interesting when we do um, this analysis known as cluster analysis. Mm -hmm. And cluster analysis basically puts people into groups um, where you share common features with the person in the same group as you, which are very different from the people in the other groups. So this type of analysis generated three clusters. One we called the unsustainable cluster. Now this unsustainable cluster was unsustainable both from a health and nutrition perspective, as well as a carbon footprint perspective. This cluster accounted for about a quarter of the population and they had very high um, processed meat consumption, they had very high alcohol consumption, and a lot of snack foods, carbonated beverages. So overall, they had an unhealthy diet. And they were also less likely to meet um, dietary guidelines such as fruit and veg consumption, and fat intakes, and so on. So their diet and had a very high carbon footprint. And um, so their, their nutrition measures were low and their carbon footprint mm-hmm. were high. So they were quite unsustainable from both the health and the climate perspective. Mm-hmm. And they were about a quarter of the population. Then another quarter of the population we deemed um, to be nutritionally sustainable. Of the three groups, they met the most dietary guidelines. They mm-hmm. were more likely to have a higher fruit and veg intake. They had a high fish consumption and high dairy consumption and a moderate intake of red meat. Um, and they accounted for about a quarter of the population mm-hmm. as well. So when we look, half of the population are not on an unhealthy and unsustainable trajectory, okay. and a quarter of the population are on a healthy and more sustainable trajectory. Then the remaining half of the population were what we called the, the cultural consumers. Mm-hmm. And they were very much reflecting what our, our, our culture is like in Ireland, our, our, our meat and two veg, if mm-hmm. you like. They tend to be somewhat an older consumer. They had, and um, they met a greater number of dietary guidelines than that unsustainable group, mm-hmm. but not as many as the nutritionally sustainable group. And um, they had the highest red meat consumption of all three groups, but surprisingly had the lowest carbon footprint of the three groups. So showing that meat and dairy consumption don't necessarily result in, a, in an overall high carbon footprint um, from a dietary perspective. Okay. And what's really important to look at when, when we look at the three groups is that we don't eat any single food group in isolation. So while one particular food like red meat might, might have a high carbon footprint, when we incorporate it into our full diet and look at our entire dietary profile, it may not have as negative a consequence as as we hear about recently in the media. Mm -hmm. And that's very interesting because we we often think, you know, oh, maybe we have to cut out meat or we have to cut out dairy, but you're saying that's not necessarily the case. Also, what I'm getting for that is, I mean, there's reason for concern there in that we, we obviously still have quite a lot of work to do in Ireland to get our diets to be both healthy, nutritional, but also sustainable, that there's a very low proportion of the population who are doing both. Um, so just to move on from that, and it's kind of linked to what you just said, so what effect would you say is our current food consumption, which you've just described, having in terms of carbon emissions? I mean, it's often said that 30% of carbon emissions come from food production and consumption. 
exactly. That, that, that's very widely cited. So the whole food production food system accounts for about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, what we can do in terms of making that more sustainable is going back to the, the earlier question you asked me, Barry, in terms of implementing more sustainable practices mm. at the farm level so that ultimately when the food is produced, it's produced with a lower carbon footprint. And we can also choose to make our diets healthier and make our diets more sustainable and not to consume beyond our requirements. If, if you compare um, our stomachs to a, a, a car engine or a car fuel tank, mm -hmm. you're not going to fill the car beyond the amount of litres required when you're in the garage forecourt. You're not going mm -hmm. to put in mm -hmm. 70 litres if the car only requires 60 and let the 20 litres of fuel flow out. Whereas, in fact, we often do that when it comes to our food, that mm -hmm. we do consume mm -hmm. more food than we actually need. And that has both nutritional consequences in terms of um, higher risk for overweight, and also it has, has um, sustainable consequences mm -hmm. in that we're consuming and, and, and wasting food to a certain degree as well. Mm -hmm. So as consumers, we can be more mindful of the overall mm -hmm. choices that we're making um, and that we make as healthy and a sustainable choice to suit your pattern of consumption and to suit your mm. taste preferences and dietary preferences. Yeah, and I suppose you've kind of covered what I was going to ask you next was, was to, I suppose, if you'd have any advice of what people, we've spoken about what farms will do, what will happen in agriculture, what can we do in our everyday lives to make our diets not only nutritional but sustainable too? I mean, one thing you mentioned to me uh, when we spoke previously was food waste, for example, was huge. Yeah, so th th there's a lot of, of work being looked into at, at, at for food waste at the moment as well, and a lot of research would suggest that we waste about um, we waste about a third of our food um, all of the time. Some foods, certain foods, get wasted um, in a higher proportion than others, um, and but it would account for about a third of your shopping bill. So if you think of the last time you went shopping what you might have spent on your groceries um, and if you bring home three bags of shopping you can put one of those bags of shopping straight into the bin so and how much did that one third cost you so sometimes I think if we think of it in that perspective we might start making better choices when we're in the supermarket perhaps make less um, impulsive choices mm -hmm. and be sure that we have a plan for how we're going to consume that food how many are in your household is it a single household are there multiple people and um, does it suit all the taste preferences within the household what way are you going to use it when are you going to use it can you freeze it if you get to cook it tomorrow night and so on so to start making better use of our leftovers not to throw away our leftovers mm -hmm. but find alternative uses for them as well and it's like that whole notion of the, the circular economy mm -hmm. so one person's waste becomes the source for something else and it doesn't ultimately end up as waste. But the, probably the, the easiest place to start for now in terms of making one positive step is to start to reduce our food waste and, and also just be conscious of the overall of food that we're consuming. Yeah, that's and, and the circular economy is something that's come up over and over again throughout these interviews. Um, I'm going to ask you now to do something very difficult and maybe predict the, the future a little bit. Um, you've spoken about, you if know, food, mystic <laughs> that's it, that's now. it. Um, so you've spoken a little bit about, you know, food waste. What effect do you think the European Green Deal is going to have on our actual makeup of our diets in the future? In terms of what we, um, yeah, yeah I, I think it will very much strongly influence um, the carbon footprint of all the food that's produced. And um, they have asked for an increased focus on plant based diets, um, but that's just one aspect of it. We need to produce the rest of the food more sustainably as well. We do need to consider um, everybody's different preferences and um, some people may adopt a more vegetarian, flexitarian type diet quite easily, whereas other people may prefer to retain the more cultural meat and two veg type diet. But both can be achieved with sustainability in mind. One of the aspects of the farm to fork strategy is to develop a, a labeling framework for foods so that we can make the sustainable and healthy choice at the same time. So, for example, when you, if, if I'm really to look into my crystal ball and, and 
try and see what our food of the future will be like um, during our in-store shopping or online shopping experience. Our labels will not only tell us the nutritional or health benefits, but they'll now give you maybe a carbon footprint mm -hmm. or an origin of the food, and you can decide, well, today I'll walk to the shop and allow myself to have maybe a higher carbon footprint food, that we can make trade-offs mm -hmm. um, in our lifestyle and in our lives and decide where we want to keep our, our, our footprint for. Okay, thank you for that. And just to finish up, uh, I'm going to a question from a member of the public, from JD, who has asked us. Um, he's particularly interested in cattle, and he said that cattle uh, account for 25% of methane pollution. And are we failing to grapple with the need to move away from dairy and beef farming? And it's interesting that he asked that because uh, uh, my contact with you was made by the fact that my father worked at the National Zoo Food Centre for many, many years. And I always remember being up there and there was always cattle uh, nearby that were used for, for, for various testing. So what, what's your opinion on that? Um, I think it, it's a very welcome question um, from the public and it's one that's asked quite frequently um, and I suppose the answer to that again comes back to the, the nature of the Green Deal and it's making it a just and inclusive transition for all. So if you're a beef or a dairy farmer, I'm sure you don't want to be told you mm. can no longer engage in that type of economic activity. Um, and maybe this, this is your job that you've inherited from your parents and, and grandparents. Um, so it depends, I suppose, on what your perspective is. What I would say is rather than move away from beef or dairy farming, we need to make it more sustainable. Um, red meat and dairy products supply a lot of essential vitamins and minerals in our diet that we would have to source artificially otherwise. Mm. And we also need to consider if we were to move away from dairy and beef farming, what becomes of the land that is currently used for, let's say, dairy farming. Um, we have a very efficient system in, in Ireland, and I'll only speak in terms of the Irish context, um, and much of the land used for beef rearing and for dairy would not be suitable to grow crops on. Mm -hmm. So all of these considerations have to be taken into place. And even if we were to grow crops on this land, you now plough land that hasn't been ploughed before, and that releases carbon into the atmosphere as well. So it's not the, the, the best solution that I think will have the most success is to implement more sustainable practices at the farm gate so that ultimately the products we consume have a lower carbon footprint. Um, and that way you're providing a, a varied diet that's suitable for all and people who still want to eat their dairy and meat products as well. Thanks. And, and you can see that really you're advocating a, a very balanced approach there. It's, it kind of doesn't have to be an all or nothing. You know, we can keep the dairy, keep the beef, but let's just try and make it a bit more sustainable. So on, on that note, we'll, we'll finish up. Uh, and um, I'd like to thank you, Sinead, for, for speaking to me. Um, it's given us a lot to think about. I'm certainly going to think a lot about my food waste in particular. Uh, that was a very shocking statistic. And it's something that we can all do kind of starting today. Anyone who's watching this video, whether you're at home or in your school, um, you know, really think about that 30 percent uh, or 33 percent is, is, is a huge thing. And it's something we can do right here, right now to start. So thank you very much, Sinead. Thanks again, Barry. Take care. Thank you. Thank you to Sinead McCarthy for explaining to us just how we expect agricultural practices and our own diets to change in the coming years. In tomorrow's interview, I'll be speaking to Dublin MEP Kieran Cuff. There are two topics that we will be discussing. The first of those is the European climate law. Secondly, we will move on to talking about the biodiversity strategy part of the European Green Deal. These will be shown tomorrow at 11am on the Fingal Libraries and Europe Direct YouTube channels and Facebook channels. I look forward to seeing you then. Mm -hmm.